G'day, g'day How you going? What do you know? He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you going? Just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right now turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 as we continue our journey through the Bible. Philippians chapter 4. And also if you want to put a finger in um, Matthew chapter 6. We'll be there in just a moment. I've entitled this message, Experiencing the Peace of God. Experiencing the Peace of God. As we all see and as we all experience that we live in an age of fear and worry and anxiety. Whether it's personal concerns, financial health concerns, uh, or issues, the government policies, global conditions, we all have reasons to have fear and worry and feel anxious. Sometimes critical situations strike us immediately, uh, put that fear within our hearts and our minds, and it's only natural for us to feel that way and to uh, experience that. And much of our anxiety and our fear and worry is associated with just everyday problems that we have. We, we take our worries everywhere with us. It's kind of like baggage that we all have. We all have baggage in our life. Fear and worry is one of those baggages. We wake up with them. We carry it around with us all day. But this isn't how God wants us to live. He can settle our hearts in such a way that we can live a stress-free life and still experience His peace and joy. And as a child of God, again, listen, we don't have to worry uh, or, or be anxious for anything. Uh, yet in order for us to accomplish that outlook, which is very difficult from a human perspective, you have to be willing to live your life that agrees with God and that He is in control and that His will is best and is perfect for your life. When, when you do that, then you say, okay, I don't have to worry. And you've got to continue to get to that place of that. So with that mindset, let's read our passage and then we'll pray. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can gather and study your word. We pray for understanding we pray for your peace that passes all understanding that will guard our hearts and minds in christ jesus those who are going through difficult times that you would uh, overwhelm them with your presence and your peace and your comfort give them wisdom where wisdom is needed so we thank you for this time that we can study your word in jesus name amen if i was to tell you that you never have to worry again you would think it's possible or some would even doubt it, and some would even laugh so hard that they think I was dropped as a baby. And something's wrong with me. Well, it's true. You can live a life worry-free. There's many things which do cause us to worry, and most of us wish that we didn't do it so much. We all worry about something. Uh, worry can lead to a whole range of illness, and uh, sometimes even it gets so down inside of us it causes sicknesses and, and other elements that can uh, just uh, give, give us so much unrest in our lives. And this is the kind of thing, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, again, it happened at biblical times, so it's not just something we experience today. It happened throughout all time. Uh, but in the passage that we're considering here with the Apostle Paul, he goes right to the root of the problem of anxiety, which talks about your hearts and your mind. It's the heart and the mind which so easily and so quickly can get out of control. And it happens on those occasions, especially when you go to bed at night and you turn off the light and instead of going to sleep, you're just running through these things in your mind over and over. Our minds are active are we, or because we're anxious about something that we've done or haven't done or something we have to face in the morning or later on that day. 
And because we're full of anxiety, our hearts and our minds are extremely busy and active and being pulled in two different directions. We start thinking about the problems we have to face. And we are full of disturbed thoughts and emotions and we feel we would do anything to experience that peace. The peace that passes all understanding, that will guard our hearts and minds, which will enable you to drift off to sleep and carry on your day. So instead of giving in to worry, we can cast our care upon the Lord or that fear or that worry or whatever it is, as the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Now the Philippians, again, were certainly uh, had a lot to worry about <clears throat> and what was happening in the church and things that were keeping them awake at night. They belonged to this young church, uh, which was being opposed by those who were enemies of the cross. We talked about that in chapter 3. There was other problems that were happening within, as he addressed in chapter 2, and also these other two ladies that we talked about last week that were causing some disruption and problems. Um, and so their great desire would have been for Paul to come out and sort out the matters. But Paul was locked up in prison, which created more anxiety for them. And their thought would be, if he's not able to help us out, then what do we do? If he, you know... What are we going to do in the situation? So they started to feel anxious. And so we can have no difficulty in uh, imagining why the Philippians were filled with anxiety, why they had no peace in the midst of the conflict and the turmoil. And, and we can see why the Apostle Paul deals at this point with the question of anxiety. And there's probably other things that were uh, having this icy grip on their hearts and their minds and why he tells them that the cure for worry, as we'll see in verse 6, is to what? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So, as you see, all throughout Scripture, worry, anxiety is not really the appropriate characteristic of a Christian life. As we see in this passage, also Matthew chapter 6, we'll talk about that in just a moment, and also in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. But when it comes down to it, there is nothing that we should worry about as believers. The, the great enemy of peace is, is anxiety and worry. Few of us are really strangers to anxiety. Uh, it creeps in big and, and small matters, uh, you know, gnawing away at our insides, kind of like a little rat. And someone graphically described anxiety as a thin stream trickling through our mind. And if encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. One of the most destructive habits ensnaring humans is that, um, is it, that it's so common to consider the, the areas of worry and anxiety. It cripples people. It, uh, um, it, it robs people of their, uh, their time and their peace and their mental energy and emotional well-being. Now, we often hear phrases like stressed out or panic attack. And, and by the way, most counselors and psychologists say that anxiety is the most common mental disorder that they encounter in their practices across the country. Not only here in Australia, but also in the U.S. and other countries around the world. Now, here's some things that people feel anxious over. Again, uh, the... The number one thing that people feel anxious over is finances. Uh, how are we going to make this month bills? Or if my car breaks down, how can we repair it? Uh, what if I lose my job? Can we, you know, support our kids to go through college or university? How am I going to pay for the medical bills or retirement? And the list goes on. Or perhaps the health issues, you know, as we grow older, you know, we get uh, old timer disease or old timers, old time, Alzheimer's, something like that. If I'm disabled, you know, will I go into a nursing home? This is why you've got to be so good to your kids now because they're going to place you in a nursing home. <laughs> or as we're young, you know, what about our future? What, what does that entail for us? We're anxious over our kids. Are they going to walk with the Lord all the days of their life? Are they going to get into drugs and sexual immorality? Are they going to be safe in this violent, crime-ridden world? There's a lot of things for us to be anxious over. Maybe even sharing that people are getting anxious. But we can identify sometimes the specific reasons and what's causing us to be anxious and things that are nagging away at our insides. And if we don't deal with it properly, uh, it's going to cause all sorts of health problems and issues. Anxiety, as one described it, is like rust. 
It coats and corrodes the mind. It weakens the entire structure. Worry dissolves our peace just as the the rust eats away the strength of the the bridge or a car uh, or some structure, weakening the mental uh, that was formerly strong. Now, just to dig a little deeper on this whole issue here, there's five main areas of that have been identified with anxiety disorder. Uh, Time doesn't permit me to go into detail, but I just want to give you a quick snapshot before we move on. The first big issue or area of uh, anxiety disorder is, it's called general anxiety disorder, or GAD is the acronym for it. They just worry about everything. doesn't matter what it is, it's just they, they worry. The next level is panic attack. So if generalized Um, anxiety disorder can be compared to kind of low-level, persistent white noise, worry. Panic attack is a sonic boom of terror, uh, exploding at any time for no discernible reason. A panic attack feels like a life-threatening event. Maybe you've been around people and you can see that and uh, maybe you experience it yourself. The third area is that of phobias, uh, from social phobia to uh, social anxiety disorders and things like that. By the way, research has done and documented 530 different phobias out there, from the fear of washing and taking a bath, <laughs> you know, to fear of heights. That's my, my, my fear. I'm afraid of heights. That's why I'm short. Uh, <laughs> but weird, crazy stuff and all kinds of phobias under the sun out there. Then you have the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and uh, which is kind of a real harsh taskmaster. Uh, People who suffer uh, live it uh, in this endless bombardment of obsessive thoughts, in you know patterns of behavior, and um, you know, and then they have to have the rituals that go along with those thoughts and behavior. You know, for me, uh, did I lock the car? And so I'll double check it. Did I, did I double check it? You know, uh, so there's always something that you just always got to double check. And then fifthly, this one is just very uh, traumatic and with many people. It's post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, also known as PTSD. Uh, and, and imagine being involved in a terrifying incident where you're physically harmed or threatened and imagine reliving the awful memory uh, over and over again Uh, and again each time as fresh and as horrific as it happened Uh, this is the essence of PTSD Uh, it can also cause by those who have witnessed a tragic event that has happened in their life involving a stranger perhaps and so the the shock uh, of the event is so significant it burns them into the memory so a person suffering is not only affected during the flashback, but they're also reliving the memory over and over uh, in their minds that's impacting them day after day. With PTSD, again, a person's life becomes a uh, hostage to the, the horror of the past. And like a person suffering from panic attack, PTSD, uh, is uh, they, uh, they suffer, the, the, their life kind of goes on hold for this whole thing, and... Um, but in working with all these different types of anxiety disorders uh, and problems and fears and worries, it takes time. Sometimes it takes years to unpack some of these, these things that can happen. Uh, but there's hope and there's healing in Jesus as well. And here's a word of comfort as Jesus says, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And this is something we can hold on to. Now, in order to experience that, you need to be born again. You need to have the peace with God, not just the peace of God, which is different than the peace with God. To have the peace with God, you need to be saved and born again. And, and throughout the New Testament, you know, there's, there's the mention of God is called either the God or the Lord of peace. Quite a few times we see that, see it in our passage today. And that peace uh, can be the constant experience in every Christian in the midst of trials. Now, in our text, again, we see Paul, who's a prisoner, who had a lot to be anxious for because he was pretty much could be executed at any time. But to experience uh, God's peace instead of anxiety, pray with thanksgiving about every concern. There's three key words that we notice in these verses, uh, including verse 7, is be anxious, prayer, and peace. So, so those are the three things that we notice there. Being anxious is the problem that we're to put off. Uh, Prayer is the procedure that we're told to practice. The peace is the product that God has promised. So when we do those steps there, 
We must put off anxiety and worry, which is sin, by the way, because you're not trusting the Lord and you're not being obedient to what the Scriptures tells us to do. And when that happens, we're in sin because we're not trusting the Lord and His commands. The translation of the word for anxiety or worry is to be distracted or to have a divided mind. It also carries the idea of being strangled. And that's what happens when anxiety and worry grabs a hold of us. We're strangled with this thing. We're immovable in this and we can't move on. We're struggling with it, uh, which is a great description of what worry does. Uh, It makes us physically sick. It clouds our thinking, contributes to making poor decisions. Worry kills the body as well as the spirit, uh, which is why something uh, that God would have us to avoid. And so from a biblical standpoint, worrying is wrong thinking, uh, which then produces wrong feelings uh, and those feelings that uh, don't quickly subside. And so that's why it's so important to take those thoughts captive because those thoughts will affect the way you feel. In fact, it takes more than wishful thinking to get rid of this sort of monster as it tries to strangle us. Well, as we see in this passage here, Paul gives us some concrete steps uh, that uh, can, we can take that we can have peace that guards our hearts and our minds and our feelings. So, in fact, in verses 6 and 7, Paul declares that um, the right praying leads to right thinking, which we saw in verse 8, which will lead to right living, as verse 9 mentions, which results in having that peace like a river that runs through our lives. Isn't that uh, better than um, you know, living in strangulation of worry? Now, we ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. So if you turn there, and we see what Jesus has to say about this subject of anxiety and worry. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And here, uh, Jesus really points out really the folly uh, of anxiety. And he several times, I want you to take note of it, underline it, circle it, highlight it, put stars next to it if you want. Um, but the times that he says, do not worry. So it says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, how they neither sow or reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are not you more value than they? Which of you can worry Uh, by adding one cubit to his stature. So why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like these, one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, God, these things of the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows the things that you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So within this passage, you see that Jesus points out why it's so often easy to give in to worry and what we can do to change this response. The problems that we see is that we can be overwhelmed that make us feel insignificant or uh, feel inadequacy or incapable of doing anything about them. So this is why so many people have the fear and worry. As Jesus advised, notice verse 26, look at the birds. So they seem so small, so insignificant. And yet God takes upon him the responsibility to feed them. We never see birds planting seeds or, you know, harvesting crops. They don't do that. Uh, They're totally inadequate for the task and they can't even hold a, a shovel or a plow in their hands. So if God cares so much for about them, we can certainly be sure that God will meet our needs as well. We also see that our attempt to change things that we cannot control. That is another reason why there's so much fear and anxiety going on. And Jesus reminds us of the situation that are beyond our ability, as we see in verse 27. You know, who, you can't add any cubit to your height or better years to your life by worrying. 
So whenever we encounter circumstances that we cannot change, the only wise option is to turn them over to the one that can handle them, the Lord. He's the one that can handle everything. And whenever we try to control our circumstances and situations, we're demonstrating unbelief and multiplying the intensity of our pain and frustration. We also see within this text that uh, our failure to trust God to provide for our needs is another reason why people have fear and worry. After explaining how the Lord closed the, the field and the lilies of the field, uh, more than the, the glory of Solomon, as it says in verse 28 uh, through 30. So the thing is, we, when, we don't, when we worry about these things, um, we're not trusting the Lord. We're, we're demonstrating a lack of faith in the Lord. Uh, and part of our problem is that we don't know what the needs truly are. But the Lord truly knows what the needs are in our lives. Sometimes the situation uh, may look like the Lord has let us down. Uh, But in reality, he is supplying a need that we may not even be aware of. So when the Apostle Paul suffered so much uh, in mistreatment and hardship, uh, Scripture never records him complaining about his circumstances. The shipwreck, the beatings, uh, were not happy times for the Apostle Paul. I'm sure he prayed for deliverance through all that. But he endured them. And, And again, one of the most important Scriptures that we can hold on to is where uh, the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. We also see within this text uh, misplaced priorities. Uh, Instead of focusing on obtaining the necessities of life, uh, Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So God's kingdom is his rule and his authority over our lives. And when we make it our top priority to acknowledge him as Savior and Lord... Uh, seeking to walk in his ways, uh, he promises to supply whatever is needed. We just need to trust him for that. We also see, lastly, the planning ahead is good, you know, and trying to live tomorrow today is not good. Um, but, but sometimes we're so overloaded in our calendars, it can be overwhelming. Sometimes your, your schedule is so busy, you can't even see straight. But he says, don't worry, therefore, about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient is the day. And so instead of becoming anxious or worried about our responsibilities or commitments, we should turn our schedules over to the Lord. Pray about our schedules and what we take on. If we wake up each morning with the thought on on the Lord and committing ourselves to whatever He tells us to do, we'll be able to go through the day with peace and joy as we watch Him work things out. Now back to Philippians chapter 4. So despite what was happening around the people there in Philippi and the, the church there, he was exhorting them, don't worry about anything because God held them securely. Worrying is bad because it's a subtle form of distrust in God. So when, when believers worry, they're saying that they don't trust God, that uh, he won't provide for them when in fact the Lord will provide for them. Uh, And so Paul offered uh, prayer as the antidote to worry. Notice the rest of verse 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication or petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So he doesn't just write, pray about it. You know, which is a very simple, you know, statement that people would say, don't worry about it, just pray about it. Uh, But he uses four different types of uh, words to describe the right type of praying. Prayer. Supplication, thanksgiving, and request. So right praying involves all of these. The word prayer, it's a general word uh, used uh, throughout the the Bible, and it just speaks talking to God. And it always implies the idea of worship. So when this word for prayer is used, uh, you'll nearly always find it uh, and attached to the awareness of the goodness and the greatness of God. Uh, and, And the need to rest in that Uh, as well in his sovereignty so when we are worried we are turning to god and worship him we need to remind ourselves how big he is and uh, there's nothing that he cannot handle there's nothing too hard for him as the bible tells us the second word there supplication this really speaks of an earnest specific need so what's the specific need not just a general term hey let's pray about it But what's the specific need that's going on here? It means laying out in detail before the Lord uh, what's going on in our lives. Now you're thinking, well, 
uh, wait a minute, doesn't God already know everything? Well, yes, He does. Um, Our Heavenly Father knows everything that we need even before we ask Him. And yet we're told to come and pray, to seek and to ask and to knock. And since God knows all things, the logical conclusion is that prayer is not for God's benefit, but it's for ours. We are to give to Him our life and our concerns, and we do it with thanksgiving, knowing that He will take care of everything. It's in His hands. And by prayer, we are developing this this dependency upon the Lord, um, keeping our eyes focused upward. And there's nothing more dishonoring to the Lord than we worry and not trust Him. He is our Heavenly Father after all. Uh, We are more important to Him than the creation as we read about in Matthew chapter 6. And uh, when we say we worry, we're we're really disconnected and really His ability and His concern. And so we need to do neither. We need to pray. So factor God into every situation and His peace will keep your hearts and minds. The third thing that we notice there is with thanksgiving. So this is the attitude of one's heart. Uh, in approaching the Lord. So prayer combats worry by creating us a thankful heart. So believers should come to the Lord in prayer, thankful for the opportunity to even approach Him. Thank you, Lord, that I can come to you with every need and situation in my life. You know, and, and certainly the, the, the Father enjoys hearing His children say thank you. You know, you love hearing your children or people say thank you to you as well. So when believers focus on God's great love for them and and the many prayers that he's already answered, then there is no room for worry about whether he will continue to answer because the Lord knows what's best for us. And then the fourth thing that you know is there, let your requests be known to God. So this is referring directly to asking God's uh, help uh, in a specific need. Prayer combats the worry by building trust. And so communication with God through prayer allows us to know Him better and also to know His will and guidance for our lives. So we can talk to the Lord about anything. He is our Heavenly Father who loves us unconditionally. He already knows our needs. He already knows our feelings. And uh, He wants us to continue to keep our eyes fixed upon Him. He allows us to rely on Him as we sort through the decisions or need encouragement in the middle of trials. And when we pray about it, He gives us the wisdom sometimes, the insights, uh, but it's also just that relationship that you have with Him, that you can talk to Him. In prayer, we are to present our requests to God, but we must focus on God's will, not our will. So when we communicate with the Lord, uh, we don't demand what we want, uh, but rather we discuss with Him what He wants. Your will be done not mine. And as we align our prayers to His will, He listens. And we can be certain that he, when He listens, He will also give a specific answer. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes wait. Whatever it may be or whatever the decision is, He will give you what you need. So Paul's counsel is to take everything to God in prayer. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything is this admonition. And uh, the, the result of that, notice verse 7, is this peace that God's our hearts and minds. It says... Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So, if the Philippians would take heart, this passage here, of Paul's words, and and actually starting back up to verse 4, to rejoice always in in the Lord, again I say rejoice, through verse 6, then they will come to this place of peace. And they'll be filled with peace. And remember that uh, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier at the time and guarded day and night. And so, uh, in in like manner, peace, uh, the peace of God, stands guard over two areas uh, that create worry. The heart, the wrong feelings, and the mind, wrong thinking. So true peace is not found in positive thinking uh, or the or the absence of conflict, or in good feelings, it comes from knowing God and that He is in control. That is where our peace comes from. And believers are are given this peace with God when they believe in Him and have that faith and trust in Him. And they have that inner quiet peace of God as they walk with Him. God's peace passes or surpasses all understanding. Now we cannot fully comprehend uh, such peace when it comes down to it. 
Um, we can't explain it. Uh, there, there's no natural reaction in, in calamity and sorrow and pain that we can, how, how did this peace come in? Uh, where does it come in? Such peace cannot be self-generated. Uh, it comes from the Lord alone. It is a gift uh, that He gives us. And so w- with so much of, of God's dealing uh, with humanity, we, we cannot understand it, but we can accept and we can experience His peace and His great love. So why does God give his people peace? Well, because it guards their hearts and their minds. The Greek word for guard here, um, it's a military term uh, that means to surround and to protect, kind of like a, a, a garrison or, a, a, or in a city. And again, the, the Philippians were living in kind of this garrison town. It was a Roman town uh, familiar with all these guards that stood watch over these areas around, guarding the city from an outside attack. And so God's peace is like a soldier surrounding the believer's hearts and minds. Uh, that's the emotions and the thoughts, uh, securing them against the threat of the harmful outside forces. And so, in fact, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, talks, uh, he talks and uses the same word that we're kept or shielded uh, by God's power. Uh, so when our hearts are, um, when we give our hearts and our lives to Christ in salvation, you experience peace with God. Because you were enemies of God, now you're, you have peace with Him. But the peace of God takes that step another further with His blessing. And this is something only a Christian can really experience. You can't experience the peace of God if you're not a Christian. First, you need to experience peace with God. So this doesn't mean that the, it's absence of trials on the outside, but it does mean that quiet confidence, regardless of the circumstances and the people or things. And as we give God uh, our life and our trust in Him, uh, as we worship Him uh, for who He is, we cast our cares upon Him, and, uh, and we stand upon His Word, He's able to give us His peace, no matter what we're facing. So our goal through ought to be worship. And when you worship, you'll experience the joy and the peace of the Lord that will comfort our hearts and minds. And there's so many things at which we can give uh, thanks to uh, as He walks us through sometimes the hard times. As you look back now, you're thankful some of those things. In the midst of it, you're not thankful. You're, you're, you're dreading it, but you can look back later on with the right perspective and say, oh, thank you, Lord. This is what you taught me. This is what you did. You draw me closer, closer to you. So when we focus on these things, again, God's peace guards our hearts and our minds uh, in Christ Jesus, no matter how difficult our circumstances may be. And here's the thing that you can take great comfort in. The call of God, no matter what you're doing in life, the call of God never takes us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. And that's the thing. He will give you the grace in that time of need. He has promised to meet all our needs uh, and guard our hearts with peace and with joy. But the choice is ours, friends. We can either choose to mistrust and have fear and worry and anxiety, or we can trust in the Lord and His sovereignty, and He will provide and He'll watch over us. He has all the power to meet our needs. He has all the power to deal with the situation. We just need to trust in Him. And He will give us the peace uh, no matter what. So God allows uh, the silent guard called peace to protect our hearts and minds and emotions and will. And this is something that so many people are struggling with. They need peace in their life. They're struggling with the decision. Well, when you're making the right decision, you'll see that the Lord will just give you peace about this decision that you need to make. I don't know how the Lord's going to provide, but he'll give you the peace that he will provide. So no matter what you're going through, may the Lord give you the grace and peace that you need. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. It sounds sounds like a rap. (laughs) Just kidding. But we see Paul again calling these believers brethren or beloved. So you see his love for them. And the word finally, and yes, he is finally bringing it to a close. You know, in the previous chapter, he said finally, but he wasn't finishing finally. So this is finally indicating he was about to conclude the section of the letter. And he turns from right praying to right thinking. So there's so many places in Scripture where the the Lord tells us that we needed to make that conscience choice and what we need to think about. And what we put into our minds makes all the difference. We're called to be in control of what fills our thoughts. 
The Bible tells us in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So here the Philippians, we read that we can consciously put our minds on good things. We put onto our minds, uh, determines what comes out of our words and what we feel and our actions. Wrong thinking leads to wrong feelings. And before long, the heart and mind are pulled apart and we're strangled by worry and fear and anxiety. Garbage in, garbage out. We must realize that our thoughts are real and powerful. Um, and so we, we need to bring the thoughts into captivity into the obedience of Christ, as the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 5. So Paul tells us to program our minds with these thoughts. Notice them. We are to think about whatever is true. So the, the truth is that which would respond to kind of reality. Anxiety comes from that which is false uh, ideas and unreal circumstances that really occupy the mind instead of truth. Truth is opposite of that which is false uh, that uh, we're to think about. Uh, the truth also includes facts and statements that are in accordance uh, with reality. Not lies, not rumors, not uh, uh, embellishments. Uh, secondly, uh, that which is in sincere, uh, not deceitful or with evil motives, uh, and then thirdly, that which is loyal, faithful, proper, uh, reliable, genuine, so that which would describe what is true, so we're to fill our minds with truth, and the, the, the Bible is true, so if you fill your mind with the Word of God, it's going to change uh, your life. Secondly, you're to think about whatever is noble or honest or honorable, uh, so we should fill our minds with respectable things rather than things which are coarse and rude. Uh, we're to think about whatever is just or righteous, depends on your translation there. And uh, this refers to uh, conforming to the standard of Scripture, conforming to His character. That is what we're to do. And again, we have the righteousness of Christ, but there is a, a sanctification process we're working out uh, day by day. Um, so whatever is right, whatever is pure, and I doubt there's uh, many things as detrimental to our life than unclean thoughts. Um, it's not limited to sexual impurity, but also extends to moral purity in thought and speech and in actions. Uh, so they're to focus on which is not tainted with evil or sin. And so pure uh, also casts the net, meaning over all uh, forms of the, the, the noble thoughts of moral and, uh, and that readiness to worship so when you feel um wrong thinking impure thinking you don't want to worship the lord it makes it hard to do it because you feel guilty and that or convicted and that's that's the sign of the lord say hey you need to change you need to repent of this and get right and so whatever is pure uh, means free from contamination or uh, blemish uh, these are kind of unmixed and unmodified. Uh, we want wholesome thoughts. Uh, we're to think whatever is lovely or gracious, things that are pleasing to the Lord. Uh, so one translation would say whatever is pleasing. Uh, and uh, it, it's sometimes hard to have those thoughts, you know, but this is what your, your prayer could be. Lord, help me to live that life that pleases you. I want to have those thoughts that please you, Lord. And um, lovely, beautiful is another idea behind that. Uh, we're to think those things which are good report, uh, things that are worth talking about, uh, to, to bless others, to, to you know, um, th those are of good report. Um, all these, these six thoughts are really characterized virtue and praiseworthy. So as one said, uh, if it has virtue, it will motivate you, us to do better. If it has praise or praiseworthy, it's worth commending to others. And the imperative, notice, meditate or think upon these things uh, it's stressing the idea of a constant thought process this isn't something that you just do once it's constant you got to work at it um, what goes on our hearts and our minds and so a believer must daily strengthen the moral integrity of their thought life it's not something that uh, i did that yesterday i don't have to worry about it today no it's daily it's constant you know as, as the bible says in proverbs uh, 23 7 for he who thinks in his heart so is he there's a popular axiom that says, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. And that is so true. So Paul gives us this list because he wants us to know that we can actively assert our determination to practice right thinking. 
So we need to examine what are we putting into our minds? What are we watching? What are we reading? Does it draw me closer to the Lord? Is it pure? Is it helpful? Is it true? Uh, and so we need to replace the harmful input with wholesome material. So those are some things that you'll have to, to do. And again, as you read the Word of God, it doesn't get any better than that. Listen to good worship music. Ask the Lord to help you focus your mind on that which is good and that which is pure. Take it to practice. It can be done. As the Bible tells us, again, part of the walk of the Christian comes down to the mind. As uh, Romans 12, it talks about the tr- being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so a lot of our minds need renewing. Um, and, and we choose uh, to, to meditate on certain matters. Choose to meditate on that which is true, on the Word of God. And what you think about affects everything that you do. Our emotions, our feelings, um, how we view people as well. And then uh, as, as Paul described in a practical way of, again, what we just went through here in verse 8, of taking every thought into captive uh, and to the obedience of Christ. Notice verse 9. The things which you learned, received, and heard, and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, Paul's not just sitting in prison telling everyone what to do. Uh, he had to live this out. He had to apply it to his, his life. And if the, the believers... Uh, needed an example, all they needed to do is remember and look at the Apostle Paul himself. Paul balances four activities here. Notice, learned and received, heard and received. So it's one thing to learn a truth, it's another to receive it inwardly and to make it a part of your life. There's a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge, but they're not living it out. They know chapter and verse, but they're not walking it. And uh, the facts are in the head are not enough. We must choose to have the truth in our hearts. And so in Paul's ministry, he not only taught the word, but he also lived it out. People saw it as an example, the truth in his life. And this is how discipleship works. The, the things that are learned, and that's the word for disciples. It's the it's a, it's a same type of word there that was used. It's a general term um, for pupil, learner, disciple. We see, secondly, things received. So someone uh, who is learning at some point needs to receive uh, the lesson. They need to realize that this is something that is true and important. I need to apply to it. Uh, The things that are heard. uh, This is teaching that is transmitted vocally or in writing. And also heard. And then uh, then fourthly, seen. Uh, This is the the, the one that trips so many people up. Uh, People don't need uh, just to hear the principles. They need to see it in action. Uh, See it lived out. Walking it out. So be careful what goes on to your minds. Keeping your mind clean. Putting into practice the things that you know. And it doesn't just magically come. Uh, You must learn these things. You must put it into practice. And uh, Paul's experience ought to be our experience. uh, That we must be doers of the word. Not just hearers only as the Bible tells us in James 1.22. So it's not enough just to hear and read the word of God. Or even know it well. We must put it into practice. And so it's so easy to listen to a message uh, and forget what is being said. It's easy to read a, the Bible and not really think about it and apply it. Uh, it's easy just to read through the scripture, but it really, you know, just, it's just reading words on a page. We need to let it sink within our hearts. Take it upon, uh, meditate on it, think upon it. And the peace of God, which is one of those great tests of whether or not we're in the will of God. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Let the peace of God rule your hearts, which you were called into one body, and be thankful. So if we're walking with the Lord, listen, then the peace of God and the God of peace exercises their influence over our hearts and our minds. So whenever we choose to disobey and not trust the Lord, we lose that peace, and we know that we've done something wrong. But we can come clearly to the the throne of grace that we may have time, help in time of need. So God's peace is the umpire, if you will, or the ref that calls it out. Is there peace ruling in your hearts? So this passage, again, again is closely linked as we saw in verse 7. The peace of God. And many people ask today uh, to, to, to have peace of God without having a real relationship with God. And that cannot happen. You need to have a relationship with God to experience the peace of God. Um, And to know peace, you must know God. Right praying, right thinking leads to right living. 
So these are the conditions for having that secure mind in victory over worry and fear and anxiety. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this passage to instruct us, to teach us about how we can be anxious for nothing, how we don't have to about have fear or worry in our life, but we can pray about everything, how we can lay our requests to you. And your word says that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer for so many people here today and those that are watching online, that they would experience your peace and your comfort and your love and your grace and forgiveness. We thank you that uh, uh, you love us. We thank you that you got a plan and purpose for our life. We thank you that you're going to work all things together for the good for those that love you. And so we commit everything before you, no matter what we're going through, no matter what difficulty, what problem we're facing. We ask that uh, we, we ask for wisdom. We ask for direction. But more importantly, we just lay it at the foot of the cross. We cast our care upon you because you care for us. So we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.